Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. I'm Troy Moling, and thank you for joining us today on Market Journal. Hope everyone has had a wonderful August so far. Lots to talk about on today's show. And kicking things off, last week, Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Tamara Jackson Zims explained some corn diseases she's watching for as we get closer to harvest. Now, she's back again this week to discuss what diseases could impact your soybean fields and what to do when choosing fungicides. There are a number of diseases showing up in our soybean fields as well, and so I wanna make sure you're getting out and scouting for those as well. Some parts of the state are seeing significant frog eye leaf spot development. Frog eye leaf spots caused by a fungus that overwinters in the residue, and so if you've had that disease before, it's possible that you could begin seeing it now or in the very near future. When you're in the field, be sure and look in the, in the upper leaves especially. The lesions caused by frog eye are circular to round, uh, elliptical, and they usually have a dark margin around them. This fungus is one that can cause significant yield loss, but all fields won't need to be treated. If you believe you need a fungicide application for frog eye, remember this fungus has some resistance to the group 11 or strobal urine fungicides. And so be sure to select products that have multiple products mixed in them with representing multiple modes of action for them to be the most effective. In addition, we're also beginning to see sudden death syndrome. And remember that fungus infects the root system but affects the upper parts of the plants. And so you'll begin to see necrotic or striping between the veins and a lot of root rot associated with this pathogen. And if you're seeing sudden death syndrome, be sure and also collect samples for soybean cyst nematode because the nematode can make sudden death syndrome appear earlier and develop to more severe levels, and so it's important to know about those. Selecting resistant varieties is the best way to control both of those, and remember that we also now have a seed treatment like Olivo that can be used for sudden death syndrome management if you have significant levels of that in your fields. If you need help diagnosing any of these diseases or have questions, please contact us in Nebraska Extension and submit samples to the UNL Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic. We'll have Tamara back on the show again later this fall to discuss what diseases to watch for as harvest begins. Next up, if you still need to apply for the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, or CFAP, the deadline has been extended from the original date of August 28th to September 11th. CFAP is a direct assistance program that was created earlier this year as part of the CARES Act it's designed to help farmers and ranchers negatively impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Not only has the USDA extended the deadline for application, but they've also added several more eligible commodities to the program. In Nebraska, we really do have a vast majority of our, our major commodities are covered. So we're talking about you know, corn, soybeans, grain sorghum, and then on the livestock side, cattle, hogs, dairy, um, sheep um, also are available. Um, previously, it was uh, lambs two years and younger were eligible. And, and just recently, USDA extended that to sheep over two years of age. So um, they also are now included in the program. Um, a few other commodities that were recently added include um, aquaculture, and we do have a few producers that do that here, as well as nursery crops um, and some types of eggs. So um, those were all just announced in the last couple of weeks as also eligible commodities. You know, I, I really would encourage producers, if, if they haven't already looked into this program, to go to the farmers.gov uh, CFAP website where you can see all of the eligible commodities that are a part of this program. Producers with approved applications received 80% of their expected payment. It was also recently announced that the FSA will automatically issue the remaining 20% of the estimated payment while new applicants will receive 100% upon having their application approved. 
there, you know, initially eligible producers uh, who turn in um, um, successful CFAP applications were awarded 80% of their overall expected payment. And, and USDA did that initially in order to ensure that all successful applicants would have access to financial assistance. Um, USDA just announced recently that that additional, um, that 20% that remained would be issued to producers. And so um, farmers and ranchers who have already applied successfully to CFAP um, through our offices should be seeing that additional 20% uh, come into their financial institution here um, over the next uh, week or so. Producers who haven't worked with the FSA previously are recommended to call 877-508-8364 to begin the application process. Otherwise, all other information, including eligibility forms, such as those related to gross income and payment information, can be accessed at farmers.gov forward slash CFAP. Let's move on and get a check on the markets for this week, and we're almost two weeks out since severe weather brought destruction to Iowa farms. So, are the market reactions we're seeing in response to that or something else? Plus, what does the lower U.S. dollar mean for our export market? I spoke with analyst Elaine Cub about that and more this week, but I began by getting an update on crop conditions. By and large, there's, it's favorable. There are certainly areas where we're going to have record large yields. You know, the, the DTN Digital crop tour that they had recently is looking at record high yields in Indiana, for instance, above 190. Uh, here in, in the Dakotas, certainly there's individual fields that have problems, but again, a lot of people are going to be seeing record yields. And so this is a fairly normal year where you're just going to have some pockets somewhere that do have problems. It just happens that in 2020, that, that one pocket is uh, the middle, the absolute smack dab middle of Iowa, which tends to get a lot of um, air in the press. And speaking of Iowa, we're coming up on two weeks since that severe weather event across Iowa, Illinois, a couple other states. And Iowa's Ag Secretary said about 8.2 million acres of corn and 5.6 million acres of soybeans may have been affected by the storm. And of course, affected, that means different things to different people. But what has been the market's reaction to all of this? You are so right, Troy, to point out that, that affected does not mean gone. So if you have 8 million acres of corn affected, that does not mean that that yield is going to be a zero. It's just going to be a problem to harvest, most likely, and perhaps later test weights if the, if the ears don't fill correctly. Uh, but the market did react. We have seen the timing of it. We've seen, you know, a 23 cent rally in corn since August 11th. And so that's, you know, that's like a 7% gain on the new crop contract. Now, I think it's a little more difficult to pin that entirely on this derecho effect. At the same time, you're also seeing um, dry weather building not only in Iowa, but certainly in eastern Nebraska, too. If you look at the mid-August drought monitor, there's this sort of moderate drought in a lot of places across the Corn Belt. And this is the time of year when soybeans are most um, desperate to receive some of that August rain and get that pod fill. So we're also seeing a market influence on, on soybean prices have actually raised about 5% since that August 11th date. And you mentioned our rally. Kind of put that in perspective for us in terms of how big of a deal that is and how unusual it is for this time of year. Well, it's, it seems to be a bigger deal, I think, or more important on the soybean chart than on the corn chart. You know, soybeans at 915 is the best price we've seen for them since March. So this might actually be a price uh, that could be motivating some marketing decisions. Corn at 340 is basically just bouncing along inside that range that we've been slogging through since April. So, you know, it was a nice rally that we've seen since August 11th, but it may not be enough to really change anyone's outlook on that market. It is a little bit unusual to see this in August. I've been watching the trading volumes of these contracts, and we usually do not see trading volumes this high in August, the daily trading. And part of that actually might be related to funds that are not on vacation in August. You know, a lot of time you see the markets just sort of take a break in August, but this year because of the coronavirus or whatever, we are actually seeing, you know, more activity in the stock market and everywhere. There just seems to be a lot more going on. And certainly we have this headline driven trading for the ag markets that I think has helped um, boost some of that attention to these prices. Elaine, when we spoke earlier this week, when we were preparing for this interview, you mentioned the 
lower U.S. dollar. So has that been making us more competitive in the export market, or does the dollar need to get to a certain point before we really notice a difference? No, the dollar has been hugely influential, and it's impossible, again, to sort of sort out how much of this rally has been due to the dollar versus the derecho versus the dry weather. We'll never know, but the dollar has been sliding lower since July 1st, and the big place where we see that impact is in soybean export sales. I saw just another announcement of 192,000 metric tons sold to China again this week, so that's great, and the dollar is helping that because we're seeing the soybean prices um, at the port in Brazil is about 6% higher than our prices here at the U.S. Gulf. So we're very competitive and we're the ones that have the beans right now or certainly China knows that we are the ones that are going to to have extra or plenty of beans as harvest progresses in, in the Delta. And yeah, on the subject of harvest, what's your advice for that farmer who has crop to move before harvest time? Yeah, I mean, you have to sort of think about what are your your what's the opportunity that you're going to be giving up if you move wheat, for instance. Let's say you've got wheat in, in a bin in Nebraska and do you want to get rid of that before you put the new crop corn in? Um, there's about 30 cents of carry to hold that wheat until May, but actually there's 20 cents of carry to put whole new crop corn from December through May. So uh, I think the, the better opportunity right now is to get those bins cleaned out for the corn. Um, soybeans, there is carry. It suggests that, that storing it is, is an option this year, uh, unlike a lot of years. But your best bet is probably going to get that, um, that storage facility available for corn. And I realize that's going to be a big struggle for folks that are suffering damage from that derecho storm. There will be more bagging this year. There will be storage problems. But the market, I'm sure, will work through it. And Elaine, before we let you go, do you have any final marketing or risk management advice that you'd like to leave us with today? Yeah, I just hope that folks don't get too extra bullish because we do have the dry weather. We do have the derecho damage. And some of that certainly sounds bullish to supply, but remember that we are already sitting on you know, very large, comfortable ending stocks, large stocks to use ratios. I don't think that this damage has been enough to get the market um, you know, looking at, at record high prices or, or much more of a rally than we've already seen. Next week, we'll be joined by DTN's Todd Holtman. Make sure you tune in for that. Moving on, and although Nebraska wheat acres have declined in recent years, in part due to low prices as well as growers being docked for low protein content at the elevator, wheat has value in a crop rotation. That's especially true in a dry land rotation in the more arid regions of western Nebraska. That's why some growers, like Brent Robertson, have made an extra effort to reach higher wheat yields while also producing higher protein content. Read about the efforts of Robertson and other Western Nebraska growers to boost yields and protein in the August Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, it's been another week of hot temperatures. Hey, what can you say? It's August. How's this next week shaping up? Yes, Troy, it has been a hot week, particularly across western Nebraska. We've finally seen that heat build into eastern Nebraska as a ridge to the west started to expand into our region. And in the way of major precipitation across the state, we've had scattered places, but we are needing some good overall precipitation. And unfortunately, this forecast does not look very promising. The heat will stay with us at least till the end of next week before we start to see cooler temperatures and a chance for more widespread precipitation. So let's get to the upper air models and see what we can expect through the seven day period. As you can see from this morning's models, the upper air pattern shows high pressure over the four corners and the front side of that ridge over eastern Nebraska. That's responsible for that piece of energy moving around the front side of the ridge and bringing some scattered showers to northeastern Nebraska. Overall, most of the area is going to remain dry. That heat's going to build in. We're looking at mid to upper 90s across the west, low to mid 90s across the east. And by tomorrow, we start to see that high pressure expand even farther toward the east. We're going to see the same kind of pattern out west maybe even a low 100 degree reading. And in the east, we're gonna be consistently in the low to mid 90s with the most of the moisture staying to our east. By Monday, the ridge really expands and we may actually see some more widespread 100 degree readings out west and some upper 90s, possibly across parts of South Central Nebraska. Low pressure at the surface develops in Eastern Montana, but as you can see, there's no moisture to bring in northward. So we're gonna be dry. And then on Tuesday, we start to see a trough pushing in the Pacific Northwest 
that's going to start to try to flatten that ridge out somewhat. We should maybe see our temperatures cool a degree or two, but overall, we're still going to be looking under hot and dry conditions. No precipitation in sight at this point in time. And by the time we get to Wednesday, we now start to see that piece of energy from the Pacific Northwest moving across the northern plains, and that should start to cool temperatures down somewhat as we see low pressure at the surface developing in South Dakota. Not a big fetch of moisture from the Gulf, so most of the major precipitation will be over the central Rockies and the northern plains. But as we get into Thursday, the ridge starts to back off toward the southwest, and some energy will flow around that ridge toward northern and northeastern Nebraska, slightly cooling our temperatures back to near normal conditions in that region, mid, mid to upper 80s, but still hot to the west and southwest back into the 90s. But we do see some precipitation trying to break out in the west. And then on Friday, we even see a more flattening of that ridge as more energy starts to come into the Pacific Northwest, creating a zone of flow. Low pressure starts to develop in southwest Kansas, so we'll see some concentrated precipitation in the Rockies. It looks like some of that moisture will finally make its way out into the plains as we get into next weekend with even cooler temperatures ahead. We look to the 8 to 14 day forecast, and we'll notice that that low pressure system starts to develop more intensely over the northern plains, bringing cold air into our region. And in terms of precipitation from next Thursday through the following Tuesday, at least a semblance of normal to maybe even above normal precipitation for our state. So Troy, overall, hot conditions will continue through the end of next week before we cool down with increasing chances of precipitation. Crops are definitely going to suffer this coming week. Thanks, Al. Next up, Nebraska is roughly 46% rangeland, and we all know those pastures are an important source of forage for cattle and other livestock. But those same rangelands play an important role for pollinators as well. However, many factors are currently putting those pollinators at risk. We wanted to find out more about how pollinators impact our ecosystem, what threats they currently face, and how that impacts you. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has the story. Home to some 22 million acres of rangeland, Nebraska is a prime location to raise livestock. The abundant variety of nutrient-rich grasses that cascade across the prairies, along with a diverse selection of forbs and shrubs, offer sustenance to our livestock operations, as well as a plethora of pollinators. While small in stature, these insects play an enormous role in maintaining these breathtaking ecosystems. Pollinators are important to rangelands because they directly um, benefit the plant communities by pollinating um, the, these flowering plants that help stabilize the soil and shape uh, a resilient ecosystem. Um, so really they, they depend on what, a, a healthy rangeland depends on its pollinators and Pollinators are really depending on these healthy rangelands as well for their habitat. In recent years, habitat loss along with a wide variety of contributing factors have put many pollinators around the globe at risk. Simply being a steward of rangeland for your livestock does a tremendous amount of good for these natural landscapes. However, as the number of pollinators have declined throughout the last few decades, there are some things producers can keep in mind when taking pollinators into account. When we're talking about native rangeland producers, just being a producer really does help, uh, really is the first step. Um, and then there are things that can, you know, boost uh, this preservation. Rotating your grazing um, so that different pastures have rest at different times of the season so that you have um, ability for those flowering plants that the pollinators are dependent on um, to actually flower. So really a good, uh, nice rotational grazing system is, is good for, uh, for the pollinators. Um, planting is talked about a lot when we're talking about urban systems, but when we're talking about specifically the Nebraska Sandhills, I really just think um, promoting what is there is really the key, um, giving it the rest it needs. There are several species of plants and insects that are commonplace in the Cornusker State. However, there are a few shining exceptions that are considered to be a rarity in our abundant rangelands. Within the Sandhills, there are some examples that show symbiotic relationships between some plants and pollinators native to Nebraska, and goes to show just how intricate these ecosystems truly are. It's called the Western Prairie Fringed Orchid, and it can only be pollinated by um, 
a type of moth. It, it can be different species, but it's a, a family of moth that visits the flowers at night and they have special appendages that collects the pollen. And then when it goes to the next orchid, it, it you know, pollinates it. So we have a, an important rare species of flower that depends on um, just a select few species of moth. And what's, what's kind of cool is there are actually un, probably an untold number of, of different pollinator like, the, like bees and um, flies and wasps and the um, interactions between different prairie plants there in the sand hills that a lot of us don't even know. On a mission to learn more about our rangelands, the Sand Hills Rangeland Monitoring Cooperative, or SRMC, is currently evaluating rangeland monitoring data that is critical to understanding the influence of management practices on the Sand Hills plant communities and soil health. This program will certainly be helpful in understanding the monumental role pollinators play on our rangelands as well. What it, what it really is is kind of goes down, comes down again to the the overall awareness and looking at looking at the pasture as a as a whole kind of a holistic um, systems view when we're when we're doing monitoring we're able to um, captivate or able to see what the plant community looks like and how it might shift from year to year given different management or different um, uh, you know environmental impact and it really does um, knowing what the what plants are there really does help with um, understanding what's available for the for those pollinator species. Having an appreciation for these pollinators is the first step to preserving their habitat. Next time you get a chance to admire the pristine surroundings of Nebraska sandhills, take a second to inspect the flowering plants near you, and you may get the chance to witness nature at work. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. If you'd like to learn more about rangeland pollinators and the work Kayla and her team are conducting, we've posted a link with more information on the Market Journal website. Finally today, for producers looking to plant late season alfalfa, the time to do so is now. Depending on where you are in the state, mid-August to mid-September is usually the best time for establishing new alfalfa stands. However, planting now can be a bit riskier compared to waiting until the spring. I spoke with Nebraska Extension's Megan Taylor about what you should consider. So it's always been kind of a, I don't want to say controversial, but the spring versus fall planting for alfalfa, it's always such a hard decision because some of those fall planted stands are the best stands you'll ever see, but also some of the worst stands you'll ever see. And really the biggest thing is that moisture and weed pressure and timing are the really three key elements when it comes to establishing in fall. So we need at least six weeks uh, before the hard frost for us to get that uh, alfalfa up and out of the ground and growing for it to actually be able to make it through winter successfully. And then moisture here in Nebraska, it's been so spotty. There's some areas where too much and some areas where there's too little. If we plant and it's dry, it's gonna be really hard to again, get it up and out of the ground quickly and efficiently. And then weed pressure is also one of the things we really want to think about because if you're primarily focused on winter annuals and you didn't get any fall spraying or you know you weren't really able to control those weeds before you planted they're just going to be a habitual problem and once you have the alfalfa established if it's not roundup ready it kind of limits those options for you when it comes to doing some post spraying when alfalfa is either you know greening up or in the spring or you could have a little bit of damage, and it just really limits your options in terms of herbicide control. What are some problems we can run into if there isn't enough moisture when planting the alfalfa? So the big thing is, is that you're just not gonna get germination because we really need water to imbibe that seed for it to actually start uh, the growth process. The other thing with it being really dry is that you know even if you plant it and your stand doesn't look super great, you can get um, hard seed, and if that hard seed would get moisture over the winter or early spring, it could still germinate. Um, so that's why with fall planting, the stand may look really, really rough, but then in spring, you know, it could bounce back, but that's a big could bounce back 
kind of a deal. You mentioned weeds. Can you tell us how they factor in when making these planting decisions? I would say just weed control is one of those deals where, you know, with a perennial crop, we really, really want to make sure that we are taking care of those weeds because alfalfa is very competitive, but we want to give it its best opportunity to get established. And that first year is so critical when it comes to maintenance of that weed pressure. Any reminders that you'd like to give us about soil or field preparations if one is deciding on planting alfalfa this time of year? So when you're deciding to plant this time of year, again with Nebraska, since we have such a wide range of um, climates, one of the things to double check before going out is, you know, if you're in the northern portion of Nebraska, it's getting pretty tight. We may have already passed the time where it's probably safe, might be still kind of risky. Um, but here in the central portion or like southeast portion, you have up until September 15th. The big thing is you want to try to remove those weeds uh, using like Roundup or use a product, burn it down. And then from there, a little bit of tillage sometimes is recommended because that can handle some of those glyphosate resistant weeds. Also, you know, University of Wisconsin shows that tillage and herbicide combined actually have the best seed bed uh, preparation. And then you're going to want to go through and you're going to want to roll it because it has to be fairly packed. So uh, in Indiana, we always say you could, should be able to bounce a basketball off of it. So maybe in Nebraska, it's a football, but that needs to be fairly well packed before you actually go in and uh, plant that alfalfa. One additional note, Megan says most insect pressure with alfalfa is in season. Potato leaf hoppers, alfalfa weevils, and blister beetles have been some of the main culprits this year. Something to keep an eye out for. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media so you can join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the coronavirus outbreak at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.